Welcome everyone to this week's ICEJ weekly webinar coming to you live from Jerusalem today. Now we had originally a, a Bible teaching by our president, Dr. Jürgen Bueller on Shavuot and Pentecost, but because of developments this week, which I'm sure everyone is aware of, we had to switch topics and, and readjust our panel to uh, talk about the escalation over Jerusalem. So just want to welcome everyone who's joining us on the Zoom webinar, on Facebook Live, on YouTube, uh, and I'm sure we're going to have a very informative, up-to-date program for you this week about the, the, what is basically the fourth uh, Hamas rocket war against Israel in the last uh, 12 years, to, uh, 2009, 2011, 2014, a lot of smaller little dust-ups and, and smaller escalations, but this one's been pretty serious so far. Uh, as of today, Thursday afternoon, 4 p.m., I think uh, we have, we've had over 1,300 rockets from Gaza, uh, fired mainly on central Israel, a few early in the conflict fired at Jerusalem. We'll talk a little about that, but we've been fairly quiet here in Jerusalem, but the coast from Ashdod, Ashkelon, all along the Gaza periphery, all the way up into Tel Aviv and even up past uh, uh, Ben Gurion Airport has been uh, taking a pounding. Iron Dome's doing its job, but there still are some rockets getting through. Seven Israelis dead so far, more than 100 wounded. Uh, and on the Palestinian side, the IDF has uh, launched this operation, Guardian of the Walls, to uh, weaken Hamas, Palestinian Islamic Jihad down in Gaza, affect their ability to, to wage these rocket wars against Israel. Uh, I think there's 70 or 80 casualties on the, uh, 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 in Gaza. Uh, most of them are militiamen. There are some children, but it's, un, it's not really clear yet how many were uh, died in Israeli airstrikes or whether they died from Hamas uh, rockets that have gone astray. Uh, and there's a lot to indicate that even a lot of the 17 children or so uh, probably have been uh, killed by uh, Hamas rockets themselves. And um, we're uh, you know, all uh, wanting to know what's gonna happen next, but uh, we really are, are pleased to have as our first guest today, Ambassador Paul Hirschen. He's uh, been an ambassador in different posts for Israel um, uh, around the world, in Africa and other places, but now he is the a, a, a foreign ministry spokesman here in Jerusalem. And uh, I think some of the foreign ministry people have been uh, in some of the briefings with the IDF and, and the government and trying to get the right message of uh, really what's been happening and, and what we can expect and really presenting Israel's case. The media battle is already out there and we wanna be able to defend Israel's right to defend itself. And so Ambassador Hertzson, it's great to have you as a guest on short notice. Thank you again for coming and uh, please give us the latest and, and what's the message from the Israeli government about this war that you've been pulled into once more. Yeah, you'll have to unmute, sir. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for having me, and 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 really nice to to be here with you today. Um, it, it's interesting the last sentence that you just said. This this war, this conflict that that we were dragged into, and 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 I think that's actually a very good place to begin, because we've had. Um, a, a relatively quiet uh, two years, um, and and this really came out of nowhere. And I I would say to you, came out of primarily uh, um, a an internal Palestinian conflict between themselves and themselves, following the cancellation of their planned elections. Uh, Israel is very often a convenient theatre for other people's problems. Um, I, I'd like to address perhaps two separate issues, one of which is to maybe just tell you a little bit about what's actually happening, a, a few numbers and, and, and facts to, to put it into perspective. Um, and, and, and then uh, I'll tell you a little bit about 
what we're feeling and what we're thinking and if there's time maybe one or two questions or or, or you'll you'll decide how you want to to proceed that i i spent 12 hours yesterday um at the army headquarters uh, in the fifth floor underground with no windows and very little air um and and <laughs> It was quite and that in itself was a was a fair experience and i can tell you that i think that tel aviv in the center of israel not only tel aviv probably experienced the heaviest barrage of uh, rockets and missiles in the history of israel if you if you pull out a map of israel and you locate a little red dot on every spot that was targeted in israel there will only be red on the central part of Israel. It will be completely covered in red dots. Um, unprecedented. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm not saying that we don't, we, we haven't had a conflict with the, with the Arab world and with the Palestinians and in particular with Hamas. We all know that we've been in a conflict with them for, for a long time. But, but this was something which, which came out of nowhere and, and landed on us with the firing of, in one day, uh, many hundreds of, of, of rockets. Um, so, so what's happened so far, I can't actually give you the number because just an hour and a half ago, there were another hundred rockets fired into the center of Israel and, and in other places. But, but we're, we're talking of, of significantly above a thousand rockets um, fired into Israel, some short range, some long range. And a claim, I, I, I haven't yet confirmed it, but, uh, but a claim by Hamas that they targeted the airport down in Eilat for the first time in history. I can't confirm that happened, but they have claimed that they, it was just a few minutes ago, I, I, I received that, that uh, update. Um, numbers coming out of the Palestinians or the, the, the Gazan media um, are that there are about currently 85 uh, Palestinians killed in Gaza. Um, we believe the number is higher, but that's the number that they've claimed. And of that, they are saying 17 women and six children, um, which is interesting because, you know, I'm a graduate of three or four prior uh, uh, conflicts that we've had over the years with, with uh, Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad and a few others down in, in Gaza. And always the claims are that 70, 80 percent of the people of the casualties are civilians. And the numbers that they themselves have put out today are 85 uh, um, dead, of whom 17 women and six children, meaning we're talking about 75% adult males. Um, we also have the actual names, which they have published, not us, of an increasing number uh, of quite senior members of, in particular, Hamas, and, and some of them also the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. So, so the picture is starting to uh, uh, appear. We're only two days, three days into this. But the picture is starting to appear that uh, the, Israeli, the Israeli military is targeting very specific and senior individuals within the terror mechanism comprised by Hamas, Palestinian, Islamic Jihad, and one or two other smaller groups. I will say this, there is no such thing as a military conflict in which innocent civilians are not affected. Uh, uh, first and foremost, I can point to millions of Israelis who have been forced out of school and into bomb shelters, uh, including deaths, um, uh, and, and only one of all of that has been an Israeli soldier. Um, but also on the side of the Palestinians. Uh, um, but, but, but this is the, the, the precisely the reason why we didn't want to be in a conflict, uh, because innocent civilian casualties are caught up in, in, in all of this. And, and, and here is where I, I so much appreciate your invitation and your uh, engagement and involvement, because we need you to help us get the message out there. This is a conflict we don't want to be in, but it's a conflict that we are not going to walk away from. It, it, we're, we're the, 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 and this is the point. We are not currently in the mood to put a Band-Aid on this problem yet again. It is not um, 
tolerable, it is not conscionable that a thousand and perhaps it will go up beyond, significantly beyond that, rockets and missiles will be uh, aimed deliberately, intentionally at our population centers launched by the way from within their population centers from schools and hospitals uh, um, being what we call a double war crime targeting our civilians while while using their own civilians as human shields it is not uh, uh, up for discussion that we are going to uh, uh, sit back and accept that they can do this and then when they feel like switching off it will all be over so that is the, 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 the starting point where we are at today, is that there, there, there has been a, a, a very, very significant violent uh, violation of Israeli sovereignty, which we will put an end to. Uh, we, we will do whatever we can. Um, and, and you can look back in history, I think that the record is well known to avoid civilian casualties as much as possible. But those that happen are the direct responsibility of Hamas uh, um, locating itself deliberately within uh, sensitive civilian uh, locations, schools, hospitals, mosques, and elsewhere, um, and by their their actions. Um, it's a it's a it's a difficult time. It's it, it's not something we wanted to be in. You know, we've come out of the year of pandemic. Um, all of our restaurants and shops and life is happening again. Uh, people are back at school. Um, and, and, and this is not something that, that we wanted by any means. But we're not in the habit of committing suicide. We will put an end to this. And we will put an end to this by, by uh, um, charging Hamas a very high price. Um, they will have to understand that they made a mistake by initiating this, this current round of, of uh, uh, conflict. Um, David, I don't know if you want to maybe ask one or two questions how, how you'd like to proceed. Uh, yes. Um, look, uh, you said in, uh, at the start of your remarks that really this conflict, the whole background to it is the rivalry between Fatah and Hamas, uh, and because of the public discontent when the elections were canceled, I think there's also something about the uh, um, trying to get out of the sort of trap the Palestinians were in because most of the rest of the Sunni Arab world was ready to make peace with Israel. And can you give a little more background to that? Because I think it's important our people be able to explain this didn't start because of the Sheikh Jarrah land disputes or some violation or desecration of Al-Aqsa. It was calculated by the Palestinian factions in their own internal competitions. Okay, look, let me start by saying this. I, I don't want to pretend that there isn't a conflict between us and the Arab world. There is a conflict and there has been a conflict for decades and for more than decades. And we're aware of that. We have also signed a peace treaty with Egypt and a peace treaty with Jordan. Um, we started a process of peace and normalization with the United Arab Emirates, uh, Bahrain, Sudan, and Morocco just in the last year. Um, I actually, by chance, was the first, along with one other, the first Israeli diplomat to um, be posted in the United Arab Emirates. I lived there for three years, 15 years ago, where we opened the conversation with them. And, and, and this is what I will say to you, is that the Arab world, in particular the Sunni Muslim world, wants to have a relationship with Israel. Now, I'm not saying they don't support the Palestinians, and I'm not saying that they, that they are not interested in a resolution to the, the, the remaining part of the Arab-Israel conflict that hasn't been resolved. Um, but they want to have a, a, a relationship with Israel. And the truth of the matter is that the Palestinians make a terrible mistake and risk missing a historic opportunity of partnering with us by instead, and certainly the Hamas, there are individuals within the Palestinian community who have different opinions, the Hamas themselves are aligned and financed by Iran. And they risk missing a historic opportunity 
to actually build a partnership uh, uh, with us, which is something which you can see the United Arab Emirates is doing. They've invested well over a billion dollars. I think we're talking significantly above that in, in, in six short months. Uh, they, uh, since the agreements were signed with them, they've invested in Israel. They are looking to build bridges. And the question is, what makes more sense, to build bridges or to burn bridges? For, to my mind, building bridges makes a lot more sense. But if they want to build, the, uh, if they want to burn the bridges, I'm not going to volunteer to be on the bridge while they burn it. I will get off the bridge and I will find another route into the future. The, the, the Palestinians, um, look, I, I understand there are, there are, are there's no doubt about it. Life in Tel Aviv is better than life in Gaza. Life in Jerusalem is better than, than life in uh, uh, Janine or in, in, in other places. Okay, this, this, is, this is clear. I understand that. But they need to make a decision as to whether they would like life in Janine or in Gaza to be similar to Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. That is not a decision I'm going to make for them or, or, or you or anybody else. That's a decision they're going to make for themselves. If they don't take responsibility, look, we left the Gaza Strip. We redeployed out of the Gaza Strip in 2005. We redeployed out of the Gaza Strip to the point that we exhumed the bodies of Israelis who had, who had died of old age and they sleep and been buried close to home in order to leave the entire place without any trace whatsoever of Israel, okay? They had the opportunity to build Dubai on the Mediterranean coast. And as somebody who's lived in the United Arab Emirates myself for three years, I can tell you they could have built something a lot nicer because the weather in the United Arab Emirates is, is not that pleasant for six months of the year, whereas Gaza has some of the best beaches in the entire Mediterranean. They had the opportunity to build Dubai on the Mediterranean. And instead of that, they took all the money that they got from, from many of the people in the audience today's tax money, which, was, which went in through various aid for, uh, contributions. And they literally poured it underground into building a military infrastructure, which would both penetrate the international frontier through underground tunnels, which they're not doing today because we've, we've, we've shut that down, or launch uh, uh, rockets through the air, the vast majority of which we are we are intercepting with the, the Iron Dome, um, instead of building schools and hospitals. That is a decision they made, not me. That is a decision which they can change, not me. We have our hand outstretched to a relationship, but it is not outstretched to be bitten off. We and 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 we've demonstrated this on repetitive occasions, including just in the last year, signing agreements with four significant Arab countries. You know, following the the, the establishment of, of of diplomatic relations with the United Arab Emirates, at during the Corona pandemic, something like seventy thousand Israelis visited the United Arab Emirates. The Israelis are very keen to build bridges. But if, if the other party, Hamas, financed by Iran, is not willing and would like to, to dismantle what we've built here, it's not going to happen. Yeah. I, a, a couple quick questions. Uh, do, you th do you believe uh, this is serious enough for Israel to have to go in a ground incursion into Gaza? And a sort of related question, how concerned is Israel about Hezbollah joining this war? Because they've threatened before the next rocket war with Gaza, Hezbollah would join from Lebanon in the north. I, I wouldn't rule out either of the two. I, I, I don't know that either of them will happen, the, the land incursion into Gaza or the, the joining in of, of the Hezbollah. Um, in in uh, the previous conflict, uh, uh, Protective Edge in 2014, um, we did have a, 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 a limited, a restricted landing incursion, but we, we went in with ground troops, with infantry and, and, and tanks. Um, it, it may happen, I can't rule it out, but I don't think it's happening at the moment. The military have said that if this is what the what is required in order to achieve the 
the directive of the the uh, decision making political echelon then they are able and and prepared to do so um, but the decision hasn't been made and and you know would like to avoid it because if that happens there's two things are going to happen and that is more people will be killed on their side and more people soldiers of ours will probably also pay with their lives and 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 we would like to limit that but uh, in order to to reach the point where where Hamas understands that they've made a mistake let's define it at that um, it, it may it may happen I don't rule it out as to the Hezbollah I will say the following in 2014 as well in protective edge the, the Hezbollah said the same thing and they sat very very quietly on the side uh, since the second Lebanon war in 2006 following which Nasrallah the leader of Hezbollah at a fundraiser in um, in Qatar said that had he realized that the Israeli response would be so harsh, he would not have initiated that war. He said it, by the way, to a, an incredible amount of mockery in the Arab world. Um, I was in the Gulf at the time when it, when it happened. I remember it very, very clearly uh, following the, the, the Second Lebanon War. And, and although he made, and, and Hezbollah made some, some rather militant comments during Operation Protective Edge in 2014, um, they did not get involved. That doesn't mean they won't get involved this time either. Um, and I hope they don't. But I, I would say that uh, uh, if they do, they may very well regret it. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for those very honest uh, and thorough answers. Ambassador Paul Hertzson, the spokesman for the Israel Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We know you if have I another. Could, yes. I, I would like to, to, to just end with, with a request. Okay. Um, you and 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 your your uh, members and your congregants and 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 the people that you're in touch with have been very good friends of ours for a long time. Um, so first of all, to thank you before the request, and secondly, the, the the request, and that is, we actually we we appreciate and we need your support and your assistance. It doesn't matter if it's a letter to the editor in the newspaper or if it's a phone call to your local elected official on whatever level, on a federal level, a national or a regional level, or if it's just a conversation with your friends to, to, to put the message out there. We have no desire to be at war with anybody, but we are not in the habit of committing suicide and we will put an end, we will dismantle the terror infrastructure that uh, Hamas has built up, we're not in the mood for putting a band aid there. And we would like to do it as quickly as possible with as few casualties as possible. But we need you to, to reach out to on the various levels to people that you, you, you know, and you're in contact with, and tell them uh, uh, the Israeli military needs a few days to do the job. Okay, thank you. Uh, the ambassador has to go to another media interview now, but we just thank you for your time again very much uh, and for your good, thorough answers. Uh, we're going to be standing up defending Israel and its right to protect itself. And uh, we also, there were some questions here about some of the rioting in the Jewish Arab uh, cities, and we're praying and hoping we're going to do our part to, to help uh, heal those wounds and ho hope this, uh, this stops uh, now. It's very tragic to see the, the conflict seeping over in, in between uh, Jews and Arabs in Israel, and so we're going to be helping uh, heal that ourselves. And uh, all the best, uh, and thank, thank you, you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I'm you. sorry, I do have to run. I have, a, yes. I think it's three and a half minutes. I'm on Indian TV. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. Well, th that was great. Let's, uh, um, as the ambassador exit, let's bring in uh, our friend Rabbi Shmuel Bowman for just a minute here. Uh, and uh, if we can put him on screen, uh, he's also a, uh, our special guest today. Uh, we've worked with uh, Rabbi Bowman for um, many years now. 
in uh, placing uh, bomb shelters down along the border, be, uh, the Israeli communities that are very vulnerable to rocket and mortar attacks along the, uh, the border with Gaza. We put uh, over 120, 120 shelters as of now in Shmuel. We got another dozen or so coming and we're putting out an appeal for more. And it's good to see you, good to have you. I'll try that again. Nice to see you. Thank you, David. Yes, there. How are you doing? Good to see you. I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. <laughs> okay. Look, we're going to come back to you in just a minute. We were very happy to have the foreign ministry spokesman now. I'm going to show a quick little PowerPoint uh, that gives a little more information for the people, and then we'll go and, and get your uh, perspective as an Israeli and also someone who's dealing with all the security chiefs down along the Gaza border to put these shelters in and what they're dealing with uh, with there. So just uh, hold on one minute, Shmuel, and it's gr great Certainly. to see you. Okay, uh, I just want to share my screen and... Uh, and uh, give you a, a little uh, more background detail, this escalation over Jerusalem. Of course, this is rockets flying from Gaza City up towards Tel Aviv. Uh, I think this was even from Monday evening or Tuesday, a uh, very dramatic photo. Um, and the IDF response has been called Guardian of the Walls. We get all these uh, funny names, Pillar of Defense and, and uh, other names that they give it. But over the last three days, it may be up to 1,400, 1,500 uh, Hamas and Islamic Jihad rockets fired at Israel. As of now, there were seven Israelis dead, uh, over 100 wounded. Uh, would say around 600 Israeli airstrikes on Hamas, some of them very dramatic, taking down large buildings where uh, most of the building is used by Hamas in different ways. Uh, but they always warn the people to get out of the buildings first. They give them time. It was dramatic footage on Israeli TV live, I think, of um, uh, they had the manager of, of one of these high rises in Gaza City who was dealing with the IDF. We almost have everyone out. Please wait a few minutes. Please wait a few minutes. And then uh, he sort of said, OK, it's clear now. And then they took the building down. It was quite unusual moment. Uh, the numbers are up around 83 Gazans killed. And again, the majority of them are militiamen. Uh, and it sometimes takes a few months to really sort out who was killed and, and how. But it's uh, when you look at the Israeli side, one soldier dead, two Arab civilians dead, a foreign worker, an Indian foreign worker dead, a, a couple older people, someone in their car. Uh, so 85% of the Israeli ca casualties are civilians and some of them are Arabs, whereas on the uh, Gazan side, more than half the casualties so far. We don't want any casualties, but the majority of them are uh, militiamen with Hamas uh, and, uh, and Islamic Jihad and others. Uh, and uh, the IDF says at least 200 Hamas rockets have landed inside Gaza. They never made it out of Gaza and probably killed some of the people uh, who died in Gaza. This is some damage from uh, Ashdod, has been one of the most hard hit uh, cities. Uh, we'll talk a little about it, uh, you know, fairly serious damage here, cars burn, houses. You can see this whole second floor of this house was completely destroyed by a rocket. Uh, I think this might have been two nights ago or last night in, in Ashdod. And as we look at this map, we'll get a little better idea. Gaza is down here. Uh, we're up here in Jerusalem. Hamas now has rockets that can hit Jerusalem. And in the last uh, rocket war 2014, they even had some hit north of Netanya. So they've proven that their rockets are getting longer and longer ranges of real concern this time. Some of the rockets have hit around Ben-Gurion. 
The, so flights have been diverted down to Ramon Airport, down near a lot here at the bottom of the map. But now uh, the, uh, min the foreign ministry spokesman said that uh, uh, Hamas is claiming to have targeted the Ramon Airport as well. Uh, Ashdod has replaced Haifa as Israel's biggest port, more tonnage, lots of ships sitting out here. There's a big oil platform or a natural gas pumping station out on a platform a few miles offshore. Uh, and, and Hamas has targeted that platform. We believe they've hit some oil containers in the uh, Ashdod port area. They've fired at the airport. They've really uh, honed in. They're not accurate rockets, but they can get them close enough where these things are being endangered. And, and this is something Israel can't tolerate. If that really continues day after day, they may have to do a ground incursion. The problem with that, there's casualties. It's unpopular once you start getting heavier casualties there. And it could really draw in Hezbollah up here in the north, who has rockets. Uh, they have uh, 150,000 rockets. They probably have four or five times more than the terror groups in Gaza, and their rockets can hit everywhere, even down here at Demona, the nuclear plant in Demona. Uh, and uh, so it's a very difficult uh, situation to really assess. Uh, and uh, just a couple more comments about what precipitated this whole escalation over Jerusalem. Uh, of course, there were tensions building uh, during Ramadan. It happens right after the Palestinians have canceled their elections, right after months and months of rejecting any peace process, any movement towards peace and normalization, which the whole, uh, um, you know, many of the Sunni Arab countries were joining in on this. Uh, there was even talk of, you know, normalization with Saudi Arabia, even within Israel, you finally had an Israeli Arab party ready to join a coalition government after the recent elections to support a coalition government as part of a deal from outside the government, which would have broken a political taboo here. So even, you know, the, there were Israeli Arabs ready to sort of more normalize relations with their fellow Israeli citizens here. Uh, and, uh, the, both Fatah and Hamas were refusing this. Fatah's main role in inciting and instigating this current conflict has to do with using uh, the Temple Mount as a place to stage protests. Uh, and it was last Friday, the last Friday of Ramadan, uh, which Ayatollah Khomeini back in the early 80s declared the last Friday of Ramadan, Al Quds Day, to stir jihad against Jerusalem. And this past Friday, after several weeks of tensions, it's easy to, to stir up Muslim passions and prejudices against Israel and the Jews during Ramadan, especially over the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Uh, it was on this last Friday of Ramadan that a lot of uh, Palestinian youths, other agitators, had stored a bunch of rocks and stones here in the Al-Aqsa Mosque, the Temple Mount compound the Muslims consider the whole compound here as part of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. The mosque itself is the gray dome here at the bottom of the picture. And uh, it, a mosque is a place of Muslim prayer. Muslims pray all over this whole Temple Mount uh, platform. The Dome of the Rock with the gold dome, it's considered a shrine, not necessarily a mosque, but people pray there. They pray in the Al-Aqsa Mosque. It's by many Muslims considered the third holiest site in Islam. But they desecrated this mosque uh, once again by storing uh, stones in here in order to come out on Friday after the Friday prayers, last Friday of Ramadan, and throw stones over the wall down here at Jews praying at the Western Wall. This is where even uh, it's the most popular tourist site in Israel. It's the most, uh, it's the site where Jews go and pray um, because they can't come up here by their own rabbinic rulings. It's a holy place for them. And you get stoned uh, by these agitators up here. And when the Israeli police entered to chase uh, the stone throwers away to, rid, uh, uh, to get rid of this threat, they ran into the mosque, 
kept throwing stones, fireworks at Israeli police. And so you've got footage of Israeli police firing rubber bullets and tear gas here at the door of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And this is what the Palestinians deliberately used to provoke uh, like a, a jihad against Jerusalem to get them, you know, cover for their lack of uh, elections, which they canceled, cover for their, uh, their non-interest in peace, their rejection of peace. Now it's all about a jihad for Al-Aqsa. Look what the Israelis are doing. They're police are storming in a Muslim holy site. And it was on Monday when Hamas down in Gaza, felt they were sidelined. They immediately injected themselves right in the middle and sort of leapfrogged Fatah and the Palestinian Authority in Ramallah by firing seven rockets at Jerusalem. Next thing you know, Israel cannot tolerate that. And we get this, uh, this rocket war. And right now, today, presently, we have uh, thousands of uh, Palestinians, East Jerusalem Arabs, up on the Temple Mount with a big banner of the Hamas leaders and Hamas flag, Palestinian flags flying uh, uh, on the Temple Mount compound. And they feel uh, they have victory, even though people are dying on both sides in this conflict. That's where we are, Shmuel. What do you have to add? And, and how can you enlighten us a little more on what Israel's going through right now? Right. Thank you, David. Uh, the analogy that comes to mind, by the way, let me know if you can hear me okay. Give me a thumbs up. Yep. Okay. The analogy that comes to mind is if you were to be living in an apartment building and your next door neighbor or a house and your next door neighbor is a known mass murderer and killer who spends his time preparing uh, uh, deadly uh, weapons, sharpening his knife, loading his bullets, and constantly saying, I'm coming after you and coming after you and coming after you. And we kind of take it like, oh, he's, eh, maybe he's a little bit crazy. Maybe he doesn't mean it. Uh, maybe uh, it's just rhetoric. And then one day he comes bursting out of his house and into your place and shoots the place up. That's That's what we're dealing with. We've been living beside a known mass murderer or mass murderers for years and years. Uh, people ask me, oh, so uh, it seems that it's been quiet lately. Oh, it's been quiet. What do you mean it's been quiet lately? I, I, would you say that if you lived beside a mass murderer? Oh, he hasn't, uh, he hasn't pulled out his AK-47 and shot you, shot you in your entire neighborhood up yet. No, but you're living beside somebody who is threatening you on a regular basis. And we need to learn from this to take this more seriously. Uh, the work that, that, I do is is about preparation, really. It's about placing uh, protector shelters, bomb shelters, and the like in vulnerable areas. Now we're learning that everywhere is vulnerable, but, uh, but there are more high-risk areas than others. And we've been doing this for the purpose of times like this, um, for the purpose of on a day-to-day -day basis to bring comfort uh, and the peace of mind of knowing that if or when, really is the better word, not if, but when those rockets are launched, you have a place to run to. And so what we're seeing now, David, is throughout the entire country is this awareness. But it's an awareness that in southern Israel, especially, and also in northern Israel, the memories of the, um, the, memories of the Second Lebanon War are not that long ago. Um, people in southern Israel have been used to this. They know this. Now we're seeing in Tel Aviv, you know, I'm talking to, to a, co a colleague the other day, uh, the other day yesterday, and she said, I live in Renana. I slept in a bomb shelter with my children, with my two children. I slept in a bomb shelter. We've never, ever slept in our bomb shelter in Renana. Renana is near Tel Aviv. And this is what the, this is what we're waking up to. Um, but we are also seeing that there's tremendous lacking. We see that in Ashkelon, for example, a city of about 150,000 people, 25% of the homes don't have bomb shelters, which means those folks are relying on public shelters, and there aren't enough of those either. And so we see that uh, you cannot, I mean, I love Iron Dome. Iron Dome, right, which is a, which is a uh, anti-rocket missile um, system that basically, I don't know how many people are aware of how Iron Dome works, but basically 
they're launched when a, a threat is perceived. The uh, interceptor missile actually comes nearby the rocket coming from Gaza and it doesn't actually hit it. It actually gets really nice and close and then explodes, which is why we find, right? And you've seen this yourself as well. You actually see the cone. It's a plastic cone of the Iron Dome rocket and they're all over the place. They don't actually hit. They don't actually intercept. It explodes nearby. But what we've learned, David, is that you can't rely, and we've always known this, you can't rely on Iron Dome completely. As a matter of fact, of the seven rockets that hit the Jerusalem area, only one of them was actually brought down by an Iron Dome rocket. And we see also by all the rockets that have hit ground, that have hit buildings, that have struck cars, that shelters are the way to go. And that has become more true than ever. So thanks to the ICEJ and all the friends all over the world through the ICEJ branches, um, I will not exaggerate this, thousands of lives have been saved and tens of thousands of lives connected to those lives that have been saved can be relieved and enjoy their children, grandchildren, parents, siblings, and friends. So I don't think you need to, the, 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 the sheer amount. I mean, we all know that when you save one life, right? Our rabbis teach us when you save one life, right? You save an entire universe, you save an entire world. How many lives have been saved and how many lives have been protected? And so that's what that's what we're facing right now. Yeah, um, I know we have seven more bomb shelters uh, in process. They've been ordered, being made, going to be delivered soon. Uh, I don't know if we can deliver them within the next week or so, so they can, uh, before this uh, dies down, so they can already be affected. But I, I, and I'm, I assume you heard we had another uh, donation from a, a Swiss Christian family for another six shelters. So we've got 12 or 13 in line now. Uh, to add, but we want to to um, uh, get some more. And Shmuel, we're going to play a short uh, video here of the work we do together, so people have a picture of where these shelters are going and what it's all about. And then we'll come back. I want to talk to you about um, the Israeli uh, Arabs and Israeli Jews facing off in some of these cities within Israel. Very tragic, but let's talk a little about that as well. Galera, we can show this, uh, the Life Shield video now. Operation Life Shield, please. Hello, my name is Shmuel Bowman and I am the executive director of Operation Life Shield. Kibbutz Alamim is one of the closest uh, kibbutzim to the Gaza border. It contains many communities, um, and they're all within very short range uh, rocket attack. The siren goes off, and you have about 10 seconds to run to a, a shelter. On the other hand, if it's a mortar, a mortar uh, shell literally goes up and goes down, which means you'd have between zero and between seven to 10 seconds. There's really not a lot of time here and you have to, you have to really uh, be quick and aware that at any split second, even now, even right now, at this very second, uh, there could be an alarm and we would have to stop this interview. A year and a half ago, we saw something new happen, and that was these arson attacks. First, it started with kites, where they would attach a very simple, rudimentary, I mean, piece of hot burning charcoal attached to a string, and it would be flown over and then dropped down, and boom. But then they got smarter, and they started using balloons. First, one balloon, and now we have multiple balloons. And instead of having a hot piece of charcoal in like a little wire cage, instead, what you have is an IED, which is an explosive device that literally explodes and ignites a flammable material, and poof, uh, the fields around the kibbutz or the forests immediately ignite. And that's been something that has caused a lot of distress in the past year and a half. וחבר קיבוץ הלומים פה מאחור. אנחנו נמצאים בין קיבוץ הלומים לרצועת עזה, 
שפה מאחורינו. אנחנו נמצאים כרגע בשטח שלצערי שלשום נשרף מבלון תבערה, וזו התוצאה. So the shelters and the firefighter trailers and the uh, ATV vehicles like the one I'm sitting in right now have been a game changer when it comes to dealing with terrorism. When the rockets are being fired at this region, there is only one thing, one physical thing that can protect you. And that's being inside a strong protective structure. And we have been placing shelters here. We're, put, we're putting them by kindergartens, by medical clinics, by all the places where the most vulnerable in the population are going to be situated. And so that means that now you can continue taking your child to the kindergarten without having to worry. You can take your grandparent to the seniors day center. You can go and pray in the synagogue and know that because of that shelter, you can have a normal life again. ICJ aid has literally saved and protected the lives of thousands of people and all the people who are connected with those lives. Um, I want to say that if you're giving, then you are sitting here in this uh, ATV with me right now. We're literally running to the fire together. We're literally covering the children who are in kindergarten who are running and getting, and getting safe refuge inside a shelter. And uh, that's what every dollar that you, uh, that you give is actually doing. It's not some abstract, obscure, it doesn't go to, it, it goes to these things. And you are literally sitting behind the wheel with me, saving lives. My, it's very touching and uh, it's good work by our TV team putting that together with uh, Shmuel Bowman and uh, Nicole Yoder, our director for aid and Aliyah. We've, we've got an appeal going out for more shelters now, uh, but uh, Shmuel, you've been in touch, I'm sure, over recent days with some of these security chiefs along the Gaza border that you deal with, some of the folks uh, that you know who live there and tell us tell us what they're going through right now the uh rock I'm trying again it's interesting that the rocket attacks that we've been having for the last few days has pushed the other big news that happened just this past sunday i was in i was in the gaza belt area on sunday and we had 40 four zero 40 field fires in one day the temperature that day is a very very hot day that day it was over about it hit 43 celsius that's about 100 almost 110 degrees fahrenheit and that only helped uh, the fires spread um i personally saw i was in front of six fires myself just in all within my own range that i was in but there were 40 that day every single every single a uh, firefighter trailer and ATV was in use that day. But you see, by, by the next day, right, uh, the fires are forgotten, and now we're dealing with the, uh, the rockets. What's happening? What are the security chiefs telling us? They're telling us that the issue of trauma and long-term trauma is something that we need to face now. It's, uh, this is something I, I don't know if everybody is aware of this, but even while people are inside the shelters right now, and you know, if you hear pinging going on in the background of this interview, it's because I have the uh, red alert going and I have that little alert going. So you may hear that, but it's happening. Even right now, we're, we're having uh, rocket attacks. While that's happening, social workers and psychologists are actually visiting people inside their bomb shelters, checking out how they're doing, and trying to address the issues that are going on so that there isn't long, long-term issues. As a matter of fact, there was even a commercial that was uh, released yesterday. What do you do when you're walking down the street and the siren's gone off and you, you see a person just standing there 
and they may have dropped their bag. And that's clearly the onset of some kind of shock. And there's actually commercials going on on how you help that person break out of that that momentary trauma. This is what they're telling me. This is what the security chiefs are concerned about. They're also talking about where more shelters are needed. We're now in a situation where, assess, where we're assessing based on the current crisis where more, uh, more where need is, is going to be. And we're going to be addressing that after this is over because it really isn't over until the enemy is gone completely. And until that happens, shelters are needed. Um, I was just going to mention out of the side note, what's happening on the street. My son, Yoav, some of you know him, he's a law school student in Steroid. He lives in Steroid. He has a part-time job as a counselor working in a group home for young adults who are cognitively disabled and some physically disabled. Imagine what's going on. They're having difficulty in the best of times. And with rockets exploding overhead and code red siren, they're, in a, they're really going through one panic into another panic. And he's been relating some of the unbelievably tragic, tragic stories that's been going on um, in that in that group home, and that's what's happening in other places across Israel. So we're strong, though. We're very strong. We're resilient people. We realize what we need to be dealing with, and and as Paul said, we're not looking for a band-aid. We're not interested in a quick ceasefire just so we can get back to the same old, same old. We would love to find a way to resolve this so that doesn't happen again. Yes. Uh, look, uh, for those who are, are watching and you want to help give towards a uh, one of these Life Shield bomb shelters, they're mobile, portable. We work with the local authorities and security chiefs and putting them in the places where they can do the most good in public places, community buildings, youth centers, schools and such. Uh, we've done some even in Ashkelon and and uh, I guess Ashdod needs more as well now, but uh, uh, you can go to uh, this address, on.icej.org slash bomb shelters, on.icej.org slash bomb shelters, and make a donation there towards uh, some of these uh, Life Shield bomb shelters. Shmuel, I, I think we've all been a little shocked and, and really uh, saddened by um, some of the uh, sites and the news of these, uh, whether it's an Arab mob attacking a Jew or a Jewish mob attacking Arabs in some of those cities. There's been troubles in, uh, in uh, Old Jaffa. There's been troubles in Haifa, which the Arabs there and the Jews have, have done well, I think, uh, in, uh, in Akko. Um, we've had our troubles here in Jerusalem, but it's, uh, it's sort of limited to the flashpoints at Damascus Gate, Old City, Temple Mount. Uh, load has been very bad over recent days. What's going on and do you see this uh, ending soon? Right, so first thing I need to mention is, is that there is, a, there is a direct connection to the street fights, to the violence, to the mob violence, and the rockets coming from Gaza. They're not separate issues. I've heard different people thinking that, no, they're isolated situations and one thing is Hamas and this is something, no, they're completely connected. They're completely connected. And what's happening is, is that the, the mobs are, are responding and, and doing their, what they consider to be their part. Um, this is a problem that is not going to go away quickly, unfortunately, because whereas with Gaza and Israel, okay, eventually, at some point it's going to end. I mean, in possibly, probably in the form of some ceasefire. And that's it. Gaza will be over there and Israel will be over here. And we don't really have anything to do with one another. But what do you do when you live in Lod? What do you do when you live in Ram Ramla? What do you do when you live in Akko? Okay. And now you're going out to the local grocery store or your health club or park and there you've got jews and arabs together how do you face the the neighbor who was part of the gang that the, the mob that burned down your synagogue okay how do you face that and these are going to be very long i think they're going to be very very long-term issues that are going to require one thing is for sure we are a country that follows the rule of law okay and we cannot tolerate for a second the concept of mob violence. This is not our culture. This is not our nature. Our rabbis, our chief rabbis have called out and said and told Jews, do not under any circumstances be violent against your fellow Arab neighbors. 
do not do that. That's come straight from our rabbis. It's come from our, from our, our political leaders right across the spectrum. Do not do this. Okay. And so you do have like in every society fringe and radicals who don't listen to authority and who are frustrated by the lack of um, uh, policing. And the police, by the way, have come out and said, we are totally short-staffed. We are totally, we have no way of, of, of coming and helping in every single corner. Those were their exact words. Okay, I know, for example, is listening to um, a woman in Akko, who uh, they, uh, her, uh, her house was burned and, and they, were, they were being threatened. She called the police and, and the police said they couldn't come. They couldn't, they couldn't get there. And she said, what are you talking about? We live in Israel. Where are the police? Where's the fire department? And the response was, we're, at, we, we're, we're stretched. We're totally so We don't have the staff to do this. So you can understand where that frustration comes in. I mean, sort of, that people are saying, well, if the police aren't going to be here, we'll take a hand, things into our own hands. That's from the Jewish that radical side, the extremist side that we reject. We totally reject that. From the Arab mob side, where is their leadership? David, where is their leadership saying, don't be violent to your Jewish neighbors? That's what I want to know. Okay, because you can talk about radicals all you want. In, in, in every country in the world, in every society, you're going to have extremists who are going to literally are going to resolve things through, through, through sticks and through knives and so on. And that's terrible and that's horrible. But the real litmus test, the real, real test is what are the leaders of those people saying? In, 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 in Israel, I shouldn't say in Israel, it's all, it, it's all happening in Israel. In the, Jewish, in the Jewish world, in the Jewish community, our rabbis and our leaders are saying, don't do this. We're not getting that same message coming out of the Arab leadership. I think one of the real shames here, um, Shmuel, is, is that uh, Israel was, was close to an historic uh, rapprochement even between Arab and Arabs and Jews here within Israeli society with this thought that whether it was a Netanyahu and the right government, even, even that, this uh, um, a guy with the Ra'am party, uh, a boss, was ready to support a government, become part of a coalition deal, being pragmatic. And even he said some good things in recent days, even amid the violence, we got to stop this and all. Uh, and he seems still be willing to go along with it, but you just can't form a new government uh, between Bennett and Lapid and the others until this is over. But that, that looks good. But the, the irony of it is his is the party of uh, the Islamic movement in Israel. It's like a Muslim brotherhood, which comes sort of from the same theological root as Hamas, the Muslim brotherhood originally out of Egypt. It's very strange. Yeah, but, he, yeah, but he's responding, David. Uh, he, he's responding, or he's, he's being he's motivated by by the average uh, Arab who is saying, we, it's time for us to get normal. That's it's right. time for normalization. And I think that he is, in a sense, but he's, you're right, he, part of his party includes this <laughs> branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. It's ironic. But at the same time, he's looking where the crowd is going and he's getting in front of it. And the crowd is saying, by and large, we want economic, health, education, international accessibility, we want to start looking at, nor at, at normalization. And I think that's what he was responding to. You know, we had the other day, um, we had uh, uh, some furniture delivered to our house uh, from Ikea, right? Everyone knows Ikea, right? And uh, we have Ikea here in Israel. <laughs> I went out and I had bought something and uh, had it delivered. Two uh, young Arab men from East Jerusalem delivered the boxes, you know, it's heavy, heavy furniture. And, um, and the first thing that they said to me, and this is while everything was going on, they said, we're so sorry that this is happening. This is not what we want. We want to live. And this is the word they use. We want to live like normal human beings. Those were their words, mm -hmm. but, and they were clearly stating that to me, and this was off the record. This is not on video. This is not something that they're going to publicize even on social media, perhaps, but they were saying to me, this is not what we want. And my sense is, is that, that, the loudest voice, you know, my, my, my grandmother used to say the squeaky, the squeaky wheel gets the oil, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's some 
British expression. <laughs> and I think that that's true. I think that you're hearing a lot of squeaky wheels. You're hearing a lot of noise. You're hearing a lot of stuff. And unfortunately, that's what's taking over. That's what's hijacking the will of the people, both in Israel and also outside of Israel, to say, you know what, maybe let's let's hold off on normalization. And it, that's and that is a real crime that we're being hijacked by these loud noises, by these screamings, by the rocket attacks, by the by the beatings and the and the mob violence. And somehow we have to get back and validate and legitimize the voices of moderation and normalization. Yeah, we have to have hope. I mean, it was a good sign. Normally when there were some Arab uh, community leaders, politicians who wanted to, uh, you know, come to terms with Israel, they joined labor or one of the other leftist parties or even a few uh, on the Likud or whatever, but uh, to have their own separate party running in the election and saying, we're going to get pragmatic, we're going to be part of a government, we're going to get stuff for our people. That was novel. That was what was new here. And now this has really thrown a wrench in it, and we hope that can get back on track uh, soon. Uh, give us your, your sense. Uh, yes. 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 Yeah, give us your sense. Do you think? Sorry, David, not... I was just going to say yeah. that that I was just going to say that. What's very sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say that one of the problems that we see is how the uh, international community, both in the form of media, NGOs, and leadership, uh, immediately support those loud, violent voices, mm. and and basically shut down the voices of moderation. That's what they're doing. When we're listening to, for example, listening to the head of the EU, when we're listening to, I'm not gonna name names, but you, you, people who out there know who I'm talking about, perhaps in their own countries, who are legitimizing and validating uh, these, viol these violent voices and violent actions. What they are doing is they are shutting down the voices of moderation and giving legitimacy to the violence to the rockets and also to the mob violence that's taking place and and i and it's something i'm going to echo what paul said before the ambassador said before and that is everyone can play a role in writing a letter and making a phone call and getting in social media if you see something that is that is supporting the violence the 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 arab violence if you see something that is anti-israel speak up do something whether it's a friend a colleague or a total stranger don't sit back and be silent about it mm -hmm. Okay, um, we know that you have children in the Israeli army right now. We pray they're safe and doing well and doing their job well. Uh, and I know you can't tell us exactly what they're saying, but uh, do you have any sense whether there'll be a ground incursion into Gaza? Uh, and do you have any inside information on that? So... Uh... So, our, our, so one of our children, our son is uh, is in the IDF uh, tanks. He's a he's a he's he's, a, he's in the tank corps, and he's on the front lines. Even as we speak, he's right there on the Gaza border. Um, he's told us that he he can't tell us or anybody details of what he's doing. Um, and as of this morning, uh, the army ruled that uh, that there would be radio, uh, telephone silence. In other words, no phone calls. So we're actually not in, we're actually not in even in telephone or in uh, SMS or, or, or WhatsApp contact with him at all. Um, and he assured us that it's not because of anything bad, but rather that's the policy. They're just keeping like a radio silence. Um, whether there'll be a ground incursion, incursion, we don't know, but I do know this. And I've been to his base and I can tell you we have a strong army. <laughs> we, have, we have a mighty army. And it's not an all or nothing. It's not a black and white. It's not like sitting behind the line versus going into Gaza all out. There, there, are, there are many, many different degrees that can take place, whether or not the army goes in even a few meters in crossing into Gaza and very carefully, very strategically, uh, uh, aims and destroys certain key installations, perhaps things which are going to send a very, very uh, important message to Hamas. 
And it could be something like that. In other words, from what I understand, even from my own son and, and, and that is for being, in, being in the tanks, is, is that there's incredible precision and thought put into each and every single action. It's not like, okay, we're going in Rambo style and just shoot up. It doesn't work that way. Every single decision is made very carefully, safety in mind for, for everybody concerned. And with the intention of what will the effect of this action be measured very, very carefully. So when we talk about an incursion, it's not, as I say, Rambo coming in guns a blazing. It could be small steps that let's try it. Let's see. Did we accomplish our goal? Yes. No. Next decision. So we may see, we in fact may, may see that in the coming uh, day or so, uh, or the decision may be just to hold the line. Hmm. I, I do know it, it seems like Israeli. I can tell you this. I can tell you this though that you. As I was just going to say, I, I can tell you this though that Gavriel did spend uh, when he when he did wind up calling us, he had spent forty hours. That's four zero forty hours inside a tank with two hours of sleep. That was on the first the first uh, the first uh, two days. Hmm. So I just want to say, God bless. Mm. Our soldiers in the Israel Defense Forces, so they are doing a great job. Yeah, we, we need portable bomb shelters and, and uh, portable toilets for the Army, <laughs> the hours they spend there. Um, the, um, I, the, it seems that Israeli intelligence has very good information, current information on a lot of the Hamas leaders, commanders, where they live, what they're doing. They got a thousand eyes in the sky now with all the drones and all. And that, that, uh, that method of surgical strikes, you have to do it when they're embedded among the, the dense civilian population of Gaza. And so far, we haven't had, you know, the sort of major disaster where, you know, several families, entire families die or something. We really want to avoid that. But, uh, you know, hopefully those targets keep coming until they can really weaken Hamas sufficiently. But I don't think they're ever going to cry uncle. You're not going to bring them to their knees so, so easily. And, uh, it's, not a, it's a complex situation. Yeah. True. Yeah. Anything else uh, you want to tell our people now? Well, I just want to say that, um, you know, it can be very frustrating being far away from Israel and when you love Israel. Uh, thinking about what you can do. So the the first thing is, I just want to say that pray, pray, <laughs> open your hearts. And if you've prayed hard, pray, pray even, pray even harder. Okay. We see, we see that, that, uh, that really God is in control and that we are really following uh, the will of God to uh, protect the, the nation of Israel, to protect our people, and not just protect our people, protect everybody here. The fact that we have bomb shelters in Arab villages, David, okay, that sounds very strange, but we consider every life to be sacred, that every single person, whether Jewish, Muslim, Christian, is, uh, is made in the image of God. And I know that Hamas does not believe that at all. They don't even value the lives of their own people. And we, by contrast, value every life. And so I know that that prayer is is is, is a mighty is a mighty weapon, uh, weapon for peace. Uh, and of course, the, the 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 shelters program is so important. And basically, all the programs and everything that ICJ is doing is all for the benefit of helping. Okay. And so whatever whatever that is, everyone everyone makes a difference. I know that I. I'm getting the message out to our security chiefs, to our community leaders, that we have friends all over the world who are standing with us because it's very easy to read the papers and watch uh, the news and think that everyone's against us and that everybody is telling us to de-escalate. How do you de-escalate when you have a mass, mass murderers living beside you? <laughs> and I think that by being able to say to people, we have friends in, every, in, in, in how many countries is the ICG? 95? You know, we have friends in 95 countries around the world that gives us tremendous encouragement. Mm -hmm. And just uh, thank you and God bless you and God bless everybody watching for standing with us and being with us in this time of need. 
Well, thank you, uh, Shmuel Bowman. We we uh, we need to pay another trip or two down to the Gaza border and find some spots for some more shelters and uh, a lot of work ahead for us. And uh, we just thank you for your time. Yesterday, when you talk about Christians praying, we had Christians from over 60 nations praying for Israel yesterday in uh, our international leadership conference and then our global prayer gathering every every Wednesday. So we're praying, we're doing shelters, we're standing up for Israel at the International Criminal Court. Imagine if Israel yep. was even more hand, handcuffed by uh, uh, ICC ruling in The Hague that uh, their, their actions to defend themselves are war crimes. We can't let that happen. Uh, and when we talk about prayer, this this is at heart. I want to remind everyone, it really keeps me balanced in, in all of it, that this really is a spiritual battle. It is a spiritual end time battle over Jerusalem. There's no doubt about it. Uh, it's complex and it takes different twists and turns. This is another birth pang uh, of the coming of the Messiah, no doubt. But I, we have to remember that there is an enemy, a dark side, that he doesn't care how many people die, whether they're Jews or Arabs and, and whatever. And, you know, we have to have some compassion for people caught up in this conflict on both sides. But we're very proud to stand with Israel. Uh, they have a humane army. They're trying to deal with a complex situation in Gaza, uh, in, in Jerusalem, where lies go out and, and to incite uh, global jihad against Israel. And we really have to stand with truth. We have a commentary going out. Uh, it'll be up on our website. It's going out if you are on our uh, uh, email addresses. It will be going out uh, with more background on the conflict. We have an appeal for bomb shelters, uh, and we also have uh, a petition going to the International Criminal Court for them to drop their war crimes probe against Israel. Uh, the, these last few days are just another reminder. It's more urgent than ever that we join our voices to stand against this unjust uh, probe against Israel that equates Israel with the Nazis that is trying to strip Israel of its right of self-defense. And uh, so you need to go sign our, our petition as well to the ICC. As we're closing here, we're going to show a video on this ICC petition, give you a web address for that. Remember to join us next week for the uh, weekly uh, uh, global prayer gathering on Wednesday. And then on Thursday again next week, uh, the uh, ICEJ webinar. Hopefully this thing calms down and Jurgen Bueller, our president, will be back to preach about uh, Shavuot, Pentecost, and then we have uh, Rabbi Bowman back with us next week for that. Hope we hope uh, things calm down enough that we can can talk Torah. Amen. Yes. Okay. Amen. Thank, thanks again Amen. for everyone for joining us on the on the webinar this week, and I stay tuned for the video on the ICC petition. Thank you. Recently, the Christian Embassy launched a petition to stand up for Israel at the International Criminal Court in The Hague. Now, the ICC has started a probe to investigate Israel for possible war crimes against the Palestinians. And we know this is an outrage, of course, but what they're trying to do is equate Israel's actions to defend itself with the worst of the Nazi war crimes against the Jews in the Holocaust. And we're not going to stand for that. But as we've seen this recent escalation over Jerusalem, firing rockets from Gaza at Jerusalem, all the stonings and terror attacks here in the city, this uh, petition against the ICC probe against Israel is more important than ever. Because can you imagine if Israel taking actions like firing the Iron Doom to shoot down these rockets, if that was considered a war crime? So we need Need you to stand with us by signing our petition to the ICC. They're trying to st strip Israel of its legitimate right of self-defense, and we better not let that happen. Please go to on.icej.org slash ICC petition and sign our petition today. Stand up for Israel at the ICC.